23rd of November. Uh, hello, Kevin. So, in an earlier version of this interview, you were explaining why the idea or the statement that the current INDCs equaling 2.7 degrees above pre-industrial levels is a bit optimistic. Could you recap what's an INDC and why is this uh, comforting 2.7, almost 2 sort of statement questionable? Okay, well these INDCs are their voluntary contributions that each country around the globe is submitting to Paris to the UNFCCC. Um, and their voluntary contributions about what that country thinks it can do out till 2030. But remember that only really out till 2030. So they might be saying we can reduce our emissions by 20%, 50%, whatever it might be. But they also might be saying we can reduce our emissions per unit of GDP, per unit of our economic activity, by some percentage. So they are all being submitted to UNFCCC in, in different forms. And then the, the, what academics have been trying to do is to look at all of these INDCs, these voluntary contributions, look at them all and add them up and say, well, well, how does that fit with the science? If we add them up, we know roughly what carbon budgets we have available for 2 degrees centigrade and we can relate these to these voluntary contributions, to the reductions. But as I said, they only go back to 2030. So you have to make some quite heroic assumptions about what happens after 2030. Um, you have to make some fairly heroic assumptions about well, what happens to the economy of these countries that are just giving um, an emission reduction per unit of the economy. You have to add all of this up. And then when you do that, the most optimistic estimate I've seen or, um, is, is, is that of a 2.7 degree C temperature rise. I would, I am very, very sceptical of that. I think the, UN, the UNEP GAP report, the one they've just published uh, last week I think it was, where it says it's more likely between 3 and 4 degrees, depending on how you read these INDCs. That's, that's the more accurate um, uh, space, the temperature realm, that I think we'll, we'll be heading for if we have the INDCs. But even within that, we have to bear in mind that almost all of the assessments we're now making about where we're going to go on temperature assume that at some point in the future, often quite a lot of decades away from where we are now, we are going to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So they use particular sets of techniques and technologies for doing that. The most common one is referred to as BECS and it's biomass, energy, carbon capture and storage. And basically you grow plants, trees for example, you grow plants or tree, trees and they suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis as they're growing. You then capture those trees and, and harvest them and you then burn them in power stations and when you burn them you get energy out of it which we can use and you also get the carbon dioxide which then goes back up the chimney. But you can now capture that carbon dioxide, you pressurise it, you liquefy it almost liquefied, and then you store it somewhere very deep underground for the next thousand years. An incredibly inefficient process, incredibly inefficient. Um, but almost all of the integrated assessment models, the models that are saying we're going to be aiming for, for 2.7, 3 or 4 degrees C, assume that this works and will be rolled out at, you know, um, in large scale um, in the future. In the 1950s, uh, we were promised nuclear energy too cheap to meet it. There's always this idea that a new technology will solve all of our social mm. and, and economic and now environmental problems. Um, it's, it's what we do. We promise ourselves technological fixes. That, that is exactly what we're doing here. Um, and what's almost, uh, what is also very worrying is that I know lots of people who work in detail on biomass who think this is, this is impractical at scale. I know lots of other people who are natural scientists who are now increasingly sceptical about this as a technique for... Because there's not enough land, there's not enough water? Well, there are lots of issues about land, about water, about the, you know, the, the structural and infrastructural issues about planting up very large parts of the planet and then moving that, the, that biomass around the planet to be burned in power stations. But on top of that, there's also, well, from the natural scientists, there are a lot of concerns about well, in the interim, whilst our emissions keep going up or not coming down as fast as they need to be, then what about other feedbacks in the system? So they are very concerned that if you say you're going to suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in 2050 or 2070, then in the interim you may well get other sets of feedbacks, like the melting of the permafrost, which we're starting to see some early signs of, and the increased release the of methane. Big holes in Siberia. Yes, yes. So we get increased levels of methane. But there are, you know, there are suites of these feedbacks which, if we do not keep the temperature lower, then many, many natural scientists are concerned will start to, start to kick in. 
So you have to be very, very lucky on the science. You have to be, um, well, I think, na naively optimistic on how technologies spread around the globe very quickly. You have to be incredibly optimistic about finding the land to grow these huge quantities of biomass. And I think you have to be fairly naive about thinking about other sectors wanting to use biomass as well. Because when you think about this, if we, we have to move to a zero carbon energy system, what are the options? There are very few options out there. So, so many of the sectors are thinking, well, we'll use biomass. So we have here these models that are being used to tell governments you haven't got to do too much yet, which is effectively what they're doing. You've got those assuming this technology called BEX using massive quantities of biomass. You've got the aviation industry saying we will use biomass to fly our planes. You've got the shipping industry thinks, thinks it will use biomass for its ships. You've got the car industry already uses biomass in some of the petrol and diesel that we buy. We've got the chemical industry expecting to use biomass as a feedstock. And we're going to try to feed 9 billion people on the planet. So you start to think, does this, does this hold? And certainly there are many people who start to pull this together saying this looks dangerously optimistic. It looks a bit like the nuclear power, too cheap to meter. That actually, here are, I mean, at least with nuclear power, it did deliver something in the end. You, you, might, you, know, you may have make, make your arguments about the problems associated with it. In this case, there are real, genuine concerns. Will this ever deliver? And if it does, it may be too late anyway. Uh, now, my, my concern about this is that I, I don't have a problem if one in ten scenarios has, has BEX in it. That doesn't seem too unreasonable. But if ten out of ten scenarios have BEX in it, and if every integrated assessment modelling group around the globe are effectively putting BEX in their scenarios, so virtually all of their scenarios for 2 degrees C includes this, that's a very deeply entrenched systemic bias. It's misinforming the public, it's misinforming the policymakers. And it's incumbent on us in the scientific community to stand up and say, hang on, this is, this is a systemic bias. It, it, it may work, but the chances are fairly slim at the scale that's being, as, being assumed. So let's look at the other scenarios where it, Bex does not work. What would that look like? And we're not, prepared to, we're not allowed or prepared to think about those because they have much more profound fundamental, or raise much more fundamental questions about the types of lives that we're living, about the sorts of societies that, that, that we're in. So because we're not prepared to question that particular button about adjusting how we live our lives and our attitude towards fossil fuels, we have this other technology button a long way in the future, an unknown, highly uncertain technology a long way in the future. We, we use that button to allow us to keep saying that actually we are still broadly online for something around the 2 degrees C temperature rise. Are you still in shot? Yes. Excellent. I hope that bit be cut. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. I, will, I will admit my, my face. Um, it is the responsibility of intellectuals to expose lies and to tell the truth. And from what you're saying, it doesn't sound like everyone is telling the truth. You have to be very careful what language we use here. Um, there's a difference between... Well, you can tell the truth, but by not telling the truth doesn't mean you're necessarily lying. You may believe that to be the case. And I think this happens a lot with, with very large modelling approaches. I mean, all facets of our life. We close our doors and we work in our own little isolated silos. And we, we forget sometimes that there's a big world out there that looks very different. So reductionism. Reductionism. And I think that's happened you know, par excellence in the, in, with, with these, these very large integrated assessment models. I think they have, in that sense that they have reduced the world to a, to a set of algorithms, a set of equations that they can feed into their computers and they can press the go button and out comes an answer that broadly fits with the, with the political dialogue. Um, now I'm not saying anyone has been deliberately manipulative, nevertheless, I often sort of say there's, a, there's almost like an emerging conspiracy and that's probably the best way of seeing it. I don't think anyone has deliberately driven us in this, in this direction. I think the, the ongoing failure of us at any point to do something significant about climate change has meant that the challenge has got considerably more difficult, almost exponentially more difficult. And as it's done that, over that period of time, we've come up with more and more um, abstract techniques for us to avoid making real changes to how we live our lives. So we had, years ago, we had offsetting, then we had the clean development mechanism, um, and then we had those other various economic instruments by which we had to trade our way out of climate change. Joint, joint implementation, joint implementation so, Yes, yeah. yeah. And now we've got this new technology, BEX, where we have to dial that. So we, we seem to find... And any ruse, any any technique that we can we can you know, only half legitimise as as a, as an, an opportunity for not making the really fundamental, profound changes that we now have to make in 2015, because we now now have almost no carbon budget left for two degrees centigrade. And if we if we think that these other technologies, or the, particularly the BEX technology, is not going to work, and certainly there's a very high chance it won't work, then the only other option, if you're going to stick to two degrees C, is to sort of 
beg the fundamental, difficult, political, economic questions. And we're not prepared to do that yet. Though I think there is, the, having said that, I think the last year has seen some shift in the dialogue around this. Um, it's certainly not mainstream, but the mainstream are aware of it now, I think. So I think there has been some shift. Um, so we, maybe we can twist, we can start to play a little bit with that. You live in hope, don't you, Kevin? I don't live in hope. Um, well, is it hope that I, I'm not an optimist, but I'm not, not a pessimist, and I get accused of both. I'm just, I just like to think, you know, I'm as best I can be, as I think engineers should be, as a realist. You look at the information you have available. I think we are, we are incredibly unlikely to succeed on 2 degrees C. I think we're unlikely to succeed on 3 degrees C either. But if we don't try, we are guaranteed to fail. And at the moment, there is sufficient amount of leeway that we can we could just about hold to 2 degrees C from what we can understand from the science, just about. But it does beg those profound questions. And I think Paris actually, I think Paris is probably the end game for 2 degrees centigrade. And I'm reluctant to say that, but because a lot of people think, well, that's too negative to say that. We now have very slim chance of 2 degrees C anyway. We've lost all the carbon budgets for a reasonable probability of it. A good probability went a long time ago. So we have to be lucky on our climate We've sensitivity. got to be very lucky on the climate sensitivity. And not have any uh, unpleasant surprises hitting us sooner than they might. No, they might, yes. Yeah. So, so the chances of 2 degrees C now are very slim. But the, they're slim even if we do everything we possibly can. But if we don't do what we possibly can, then they've gone altogether. And I think Paris is actually that, is that tipping point, if you like, between whether 2 degrees C remains a viable goal or not. I'm sure people will talk about it afterwards, but I think effectively, if we don't get something very significant out of Paris... More than what's have... currently likely. Because my understanding is yeah. everyone's going to turn up, they're going to put their INDC on the table, the poor countries are going to beat the rich countries for um, money, for adaptation, which they're totally entitled to do, Everyone's going to have a wrangle about what the review dates should be. And the Indians are saying now we don't want any review dates until 2030. Yeah. Um, and then there'll be another photo opportunity to match the one at the beginning of the two weeks where the world leaders turn up. Bish bosh, nous sommes fantastiques, say the French. That's certainly a risk if you go in that direction. And I think at the moment I would say I'm not, I'm not a betting person, but that's broadly the, you know, where it looks like it's heading. I mean, I think if you have 70% chance that's the outcome you might get. But then there's, there is still some, there's still a little bit to play for. Yeah. And if, if it comes out like that, then 2 degrees C has gone. Explain what 2 degrees is to people oh, who think that the difference yeah. between the temperature being 19 and 21 in their room is the difference between a, yeah, you know, yeah. wearing a cardigan and not. And, and also in that answer, explain sort of what happened at Copenhagen with the Copenhagen Accord, because that's where the we will keep below 2 degrees yes, thing really yeah. got nailed down. Yeah. Right, there's a lot you've asked for there. Um, you've got two minutes. Right, well, two, two, right, two degrees C is uh, obviously on a cold day in Manchester or wherever you happen to be living. You know, many parts of the world you think, well, that's, that's fine, I can cope with two degrees C warm. It makes no difference. But this is a global average, a very unhelpful sort of scientific framing, really, for, for the rest of the population. So it doesn't sound like very much, but it's a global average. Firstly, it's an average for the whole planet, which means the land warms up more because the seas take much longer to warm up because the oceans, the, the thermal mass of water is... Um, is such that, you know, that they will take longer to warm up. So as a global average of two, that means probably near a three degrees C on land. But then it's the regional variations. You know, that will vary hugely around the, around the planet. So two degrees C as a global average is about six degrees or so in the poles. But then on top of that, it's not just that global average. You then say, well, actually, what we live in is weather. We don't we live in climate. We live in the day-to-day -day weather. So it's what would the impact of that be, particularly on extremes? So during heat waves, during droughts, do, what does it do to those, those, those events that occur anyway? Those weather events that occur, you now have to superimpose this climate signal on top. When you start to do that, you start to look at the impacts that are associated with that, and then we assess whether those impacts are ones that we can live with or not. And that's not the job of scientists, they can inform that debate, but civil society has to say, we think that's too dangerous set of impacts and that's an acceptable set of impacts. And basically, um, well, if we're really blunt about it, relatively rich white people, and probably mostly men, um, in the Northern Hemisphere, had said that have to come up with the conclusion that 2 degrees C is, a, is about the right threshold above which the impacts are no longer acceptable or dangerous, and the ones below that are just about acceptable. If you're poor and you live in the Southern Hemisphere and you're in a climate, climatically vulnerable part of the globe, which many of them are, then 2 degrees C is always is already dangerous and undoubtedly for some of them will be and already is for some, has been already for some, deadly. So it depends on where you live as to where you think 2 degrees C is the appropriate threshold. I personally, as a citizen, think we should have gone for a lower threshold. We should have gone for one or one and a half degrees C. But as, as someone who works 
intimately in this area now, I don't think we've got any chance of going any better than the 2 degrees C wise. That's the best that we can hope for. And in my view, we should be doing everything we, we, everything we can, not even reasonably can. If we reasonably can try these things, then we're not trying hard enough. You know, everything we can unreasonably do to hold ourselves to 2 degrees centigrade. Because I think the, the repercussions of that for some more climatically vulnerable parts of the world are dire. Um, and they will also play out for some of the poorer people in, in richer parts of the world as well. Uh, so 2 degrees C is a very important threshold. But it doesn't mean, of course, it's not as if you go straight over a cliff. But it is, it is like going over, over a very steep road and your brakes aren't working very well. So you start to accelerate away. And that's, because you get some positive feedback. You get really sets of positive feedbacks that start to thrust make... melt. Yeah. So there are, loss. Yeah. there are suites of feedbacks that could make the situation worse. And we have to be very careful not to overplay how our level of knowledge about these. Yeah. We understand you know, roughly what that suite of feedbacks are. We cannot understand with any degree of precision as to when they will kick in. But what we do know for certainty is that the higher the temperature goes, the higher the probability is that those feedbacks will kick in. Um, and there are certainly, there's a, there's, as often with, with science, there's, there's some disagreement. Well, you know, people have, diff have their different views as to where those feedbacks will become more important. Some people think 2 degrees C is already too high and the feedbacks will kick in. And we certainly can see that with some feedbacks already. Others think it will be some higher temperature of 3 or 4 degrees C before we start to see very severe levels of impacts. But, you know, we can rest assured that the scientific community has a, is a, has a consensus view, or I think a unanimous view, that there are feedbacks out there, and on average they're going to make the situation worse. Don't pick the beast. Copenhagen.